Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing today? Very good. We want to say hello to everybody watching in North County and watching online. God bless y'all. Let's give those people a hand. God bless you. And anybody watching online that was in Georgia where I was at this weekend or Florida and all y'all, God bless y'all. Love y'all. Miss y'all already. Uh, everyone doing good today? Uh, Saturday, East County, we've been talking about for a long time. Let's do a ground break and bring all your friends. It's going to be great. And next Sunday, we're going to have some gang members up here, former gang members, and we're excited about that. Good friends of mine uh, that love God, and it's, it's going to be a blessing. It's going to be so much fun. Bring some thugs up in the house. Okay, very good. <laughs> bring all your thug friends, and if you're a thug here already, bring some more friends. Okay. Amen. Amen. Let's see your Bibles today. Word. One more time, let's see your Bible. Say word. word. Let's see your pens. Amen. Lesson plan, lesson plan. Let's turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, and you will notice your lesson plan is empty. Write down what God speaks to you about anything. It has to do with what I'm saying or not. Just write it down so you know. And as you are listening to the message or any message on the radio, wherever you go, I want to encourage you when God says something to you that sticks. It may be a one-liner, it may be an illustration. Write it down. Don't let it go to waste. And as you turn to Acts 10, if you're a pastor... Uh, or you go to another church, we are having our first Do Something Church conference this week. We are going to be teaching church leaders how to mobilize their people to go minister in the community. Last year we did 235,000 hours of volunteer service uh, through 120-something ministries that we have now that are volunteer-led in the community, outreach ministries. So we're going to be teaching the basic principles that we Go by to do that, and uh, it's this Thursday. You can go to dosomethingchurch.org, dosomethingchurch.org, and get all the information about it. Um, And hopefully it'll be a blessing. We're very much looking forward to that. We got churches from all over the country, from Australia, Africa, all all over the world for that matter. So very excited about it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for being good to us. Thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, I pray you challenge us today and kick us in the butt, get out of our seat and go do something that's a little scary. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week I was in Orlando, Florida and Georgia. I was in Orlando, Florida, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then I spoke to a pro athletes conference, pro football players. And then I went to a church in Robbins, Georgia, which is 90 minutes outside of Atlanta. Never heard of Robbins, Georgia. Only been to Georgia three times in my life, maybe, can't even remember the other two. Um, and growing up in New York, you know, the South was a place that, when I was growing up, I was somewhat nervous to go to because of all the racism stuff that I grew up with, not now, but I grew up with back in the 60s and 70s, and so in my mind, and I never really went to the South a whole lot, uh, so I just had that in my head. I know it's not like that today, as a matter of fact, I've been to been down there since and have, have great experiences, but, but you know, just not, it's not often. So I'm driving, I flew into Atlanta and I'm driving an hour and a half out to somewhere to go to this church. People were fantastic, wonderful, loved the, the pastor and all his team. They were great, very gracious and we had a great time. But we did have a lot of fun joking about the fact that I was a little uncomfortable being in the South. Not really uncomfortable, just the, the history. And, uh, we were, and, and it, what, what made it even more uh, uh, redneckish was, because they were self-proclaimed rednecks. And we were joking about that. They said, wow, we rednecks out here. You know? And they were just joking about it. It was a men's meeting with a thousand men, and they were auctioning off pickup trucks. <laughs> and guns. <laughs> like plural. I, I'm like, you're going to do what? They had big boxes with rifles in them. And I was like, man, this is concrete. And I was like, listen, I, I have to let y'all know, I got, a, I got a GPS chip in my body, so don't be doing nothing to me. People are going to come find you. We were just joking. Around. It was joke, 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 joke. And it was all good and fun. And left there, and I hope to go back, and it, it was great. So let me emphasize, they were wonderful. Fifteen years ago or so, I was in North Carolina. And I spoke at a church, and then some of the people, I spoke at some event. And some of the people invited me to go to a restaurant owned by one of the people in the, in the, in the event, and they were going to uh, have me eat 
Barbecue. Now, you have to understand the barbecue we understand, the barbecue I understand is like a red sauce that you bake stuff or cook stuff in and you put on. This was pork in like vinegar oil. That's the kind of barbecue. And I, I thought it was barbecue like Phil's. No, this wasn't Phil's. This was Jane's. It was something different. <laughs> and I'm the kind of guy that if I don't like food, I will not eat it to be nice. I'll just say, yeah, you know, I'm not, and I'll just kind of weasel out of it. And that was one of them times. I just said, I can't eat that. I'm sorry. And uh, so we're talking, and the lady started to tell me about her church, how there was a time not too far in the recent past that they did not allow blacks in their church, in, in like the year before. <laughs> so we had a very good conversation about that. Today I want to talk about discrimination in the church. Now, this is not whites not wanting blacks. This is just people having an issue with people who are not like them. This is about people having an issue with people who are not like them. Because God doesn't show favoritism. One of the beautiful things about our congregation is that we are all kinds. More kinds than you think. In other words, there are kinds that's not only visible to the eye kinds. Like there are criminals in here. You can't tell criminals. You cannot tell criminals by the outward appearance. Because there are criminals in here who might not look like what you think a criminal looks like if you even have a picture in your mind of what a criminal looks like, which you shouldn't because they all look like everybody. There's people in here who do things that you would never do. So the reason I'm talking about this is because as we continue our series through the book of Acts, the book of Acts started with a Jewish church. And the Jewish church, and when I say Jews, they were Jews uh, as descendants of Abraham, but they accepted Christ as their Savior. Peter was a Jew. The apostles were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. Yet they accepted Christ and became Christians, but they were still Jews. Because Jews were, were Jews in the physical, a, a Christian is a Jew spiritually. A Jew is someone who is circumcised in the flesh. A, a Christian is someone who is circumcised in the heart. So the whole, whole Jewish culture was pointing towards being a spiritual Jew. So if you're a Christian, you are a spiritual Jew. Okay. But in the beginning, the Jewish church or the Christian church were all Jews, and they actually discriminated against the non-Jew. So backwards to today. I'm going to say it again slow, and then I'm going to pause for emphasis. In the beginning, the Christian church were made up of Jews, and they discriminated against the non-Jew. And they said, only the Holy Spirit and Jesus was for the Jews, not the non-Jew. And so in this story we're going to look at, God is going to break that mold and tell Peter, the Jew, who's now a Christian, no, y'all need to share the gospel with everybody. Okay? Very simple. Now, getting back to the racism thing, just as a side note, please don't ever say you don't see color. No, real, I don't see color. Yes, you do. That's why you're saying it. What is it that you don't see that you're saying you don't see? If you don't see it, then there's nothing to see. So there's nothing, there's nothing to not see if it's not there. It's like, it's like when you get a tan, don't you want people to acknowledge your tan, yes or no? So why wouldn't you want God to acknowledge the beautiful colors he gave people? It's, a, it's an insult to God. So if you say, well, I don't see color, then what did you see? Does everybody look like you? How racist is that? So if God made me a beautiful golden tan... Please acknowledge what God did. <laughs> Please acknowledge what God did. And, and whatever shade you are, I was, watching, I was watching Sanford and Son back in the day. Red Fox was hilarious. And someone robbed him or was robbed something. I can't remember the whole scene, but the police came and they said, uh, Mr. Sanford, was the perpetrator colored? And he said, yeah, he was colored white. <laughs> Everybody's colored. <laughs> God didn't give anybody no color. Everybody's colored. So, but I know it's politically correct. Don't be politically correct. Be biblically correct. And if you see someone who's Hispanic, please respect and honor the Hispanic culture. If you see someone who's white, black, Chinese, whatever it is, God made that. So don't, don't, don't say you don't see it. Acknowledge it. Yes, it's more pressure for you to respect it. Exactly. So let's, let's not be like the world. Everybody is not the same that way. You know, it's like Little League. No one can be the MVP. There are some Little League players that are just better than everybody else. 
It's just a fact. It's just it is. So we don't want to respect what God did. He made a flower. He made a rose. He made a tulip. He made a daisy. Acknowledge the different flowers that he made in people. Amen? Amen. So uh, in the story, it's, a man, it's, it's about a man named Cornelius. Everyone say Cornelius. He was a Gentile or a non-Jew. He was a Roman soldier. He feared God. He prayed to God. He gave to the poor. But he didn't have a relationship with God. Then there was a man named Peter. Say Peter. Peter. He was Jesus' disciple. He's the head of the Christian church, but he's Jewish. And he thinks, I'm not supposed to associate with non-Jews. But the gospel came for everybody. And he represented the gospel. And so in this story, God is going to show him in a very vivid way, do not discriminate against anybody. Okay? I want to challenge two groups in here. Number one, all y'all who are Christian, I don't ever want you to limit the people you share God's love with to the people you feel comfortable with. In other words, you may feel, well, this is my group. I've had people so many times come to me to ask me to witness to somebody because they say, well, you can more relate. I said, well, that may be true that I can more relate. But, it, but you need to get out your box and share the gospel not thinking they're not going to listen to you. And I'm going to say, like, for example, there may be some young brothers in here listening. You got sagging pants. You know, you, you got your hat on backwards. You may think, I, I want to challenge you. One, get a belt. Okay, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me. I, you know, I, 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 now, they ain't not, it's a cultural thing. There's really nothing wrong with it. It's just a cultural thing. So you don't want to get a belt. It's on you. I'm just joking. But the point is, if you see someone with sagging pants, don't assume anything about them. Anything. They got sagging pants. Just like if you got a tie, I'm not going to assume that you're a white, common, white collar criminal. <laughs> I'm just going to assume you're a guy with a tie. So I'm going to tell the guy with the sagging pants, I want to challenge you, go talk to the guy with the tie. Don't matter what he may, you may think he thinks about you, get all that out of your head. Go talk to him and talk to him about Jesus. If he's uncomfortable, that's his problem. And vice versa. And take advantage of your opportunity when you come to The Rock around people that you may not normally be around. Go talk to them. They ain't going to beat you up out there. They ain't. It ain't going to happen. Now, if you say the wrong thing and they may catch you downtown, that's another story. But don't say the wrong thing. <laughs> I can only vouch for right here in this area right here. Okay? Uh, chapter, one, chapter 10, verse 1, it says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, who was of the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with his household and gave alms, donations, generously to the people and prayed to God continually. Here's a Roman centurion. A cohort was a thousand soldiers. A centurion was over a hundred. So there were ten centurions over a cohort. He was one of them. He was a non-Jew. He prayed to God. He gave to the poor. He was a God-fearing man. We're going to see in a minute he, had no, he didn't have Jesus in his life. You know there are some really God-fearing, nice people who don't have God. And they are sometimes nicer than people who have God. Now, what does that mean? Nothing. In this sense, it doesn't mean they're going to heaven. You have to have God to go to heaven. You don't have to be nicer than someone to go to heaven. There's some people that are just really nice. They're born that way. That's their personality, their servant, they're, they're humble, they're, there's you first personality. And then there's other people who are very aggressive and we call them prideful. No, they're just very aggressive. They're not necessarily prideful. And people who are real quiet aren't necessarily humble. That's their personality. That's the way God made them. They get no credit for that. So just because someone's really nice, oh, they're going to go to heaven? No, they're just as much a sinner as the guy who's loud. Okay? So do you have Christ? So this guy was a nice guy. He prayed to God. He was seeking God. But he wasn't a Christian. Verse 3, at the ninth hour, the day was clearly, the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision the angel of God. And he stared at him in terror. Everyone say terror. If you see God, you will be in terror. Oh, but he's God, he's loving. Oh, yeah, he's God, he's loving. But it will be something like you never seen it in your life. And you will be tripping. How do I know? Because I saw God. When I was 19 years old, God, Jesus Christ appeared to me and I was in terror. 
I couldn't move my arm. I couldn't speak. I opened my mouth. I couldn't speak. Words would not come out. I said, come out words. They said, no, we ain't coming out because he's over there. <laughs> Verse 4, he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said, your prayers and your arms have ascended to, as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with a man named Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel spoke to him, he departed, and he called two servants, a devout soldier from among those who attended to him, and having relayed everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. What Cornelius said, he saw this angel, and the angel said, send men to Joppa, bring Simon, he will tell you who you're praying to. What did Cornelius do? Immediately he acted. Let's keep reading. At the same time, verse 9, at the same time, the next day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while he was preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. So here's Peter. He's just minding his own business. And all of a sudden, God puts him in a trance. And he sees a sheet come from heaven. And look what it says in verse 12. And there were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice from heaven. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, by no means, Lord. Wait a minute. If God tells you to do something, you do not say no. <laughs> you just don't. You say yes, sir. Notice how Cornelius said to his servants, go to Peter's house, and they said, yes, sir. God says to Peter, Peter, eat. He says, no. Peter always was doing this. Even when Jesus said, Peter, I'm going to wash your feet. He said, no, Lord. You can't wash my feet. And then Jesus said, well, I can't have nothing to do with you. And Peter said, okay, and then wash my whole body. <laughs> he was just, does that mean Peter was rebellious? His personality. Okay. I mean, he's wrong. He says, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Context. God called the Jews out of the world 2,000 years previous and said, you are going to be my people. He told Abraham, through you all the nations will be blessed. And Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel had 12 sons and thus all the Jews. He says, you are going to be my people and through you the world will be blessed. And I will separate you from all the nations. And one of the ways he separated them is he gave them a very specific diet. And part of the reason he gave them a very specific diet was to separate them from the diets of the pagans. Because sometimes the pagans would use their food to sacrifice to gods. And so God said, I'm going to give you a very specific diet. And this is going to be the diet that's going to separate you from everybody else. And what they did is they took it one step further. They said, not only are we going to eat different food, we are not even going to associate with those people. Because our food is, separates us from them. Our, and we're not going to hang out with them. And we're not going to have fellowship with them. We're not going to break bread with them because they are unclean just like their food is unclean. What God is saying here is those days are over. Go eat the food and witness to the people. Because I brought you out of the world, the Jews, to bring Christ into the world. But I really meant, and it was only step one of step two, which was going to bring the gospel to the whole world. Because what God told Abraham is that through you, all the nations will be blessed, not just your people. But he had to start somewhere. So what he's telling Peter in this trance is that you are now going to, to talk to everybody. Now, this is... Very fascinating. Cornelius is praying, praying, praying. He don't know Peter. Peter don't know him. He's praying, praying, praying. And he says, dear God, dear God. And God says to him, uh, Cornelius, send men to Joppa to go talk to Peter. Peter has no idea this is happening. He's over there trying to cook some hamburgers. And God puts him in a trance. A tra a trance and God says, I want you to eat all this food. And he says, whatever, I call, whatever I, you call unclean, I call clean. And if I call it clean, it's okay. Peter wakes up from the trance going, what was that about? Knock at the door. A Gentile wants you to come share the gospel. And he goes, oh. If God is speaking to you on the left, he is, so, he is also speaking to someone on the right. 
So if God is preparing you to do something, understand he's preparing somebody else. Understand this, God is organized. Let's take a step back. He made the heavens and the earth. Is it organized? Most definitely. He says, you know what, I'm going to make animals and fish and people, they're going to breathe in oxygen. Wow, where am I going to get the oxygen? How about if I make plants breathe out oxygen? He's organized. Did you know that two-thirds of the oxygen you breathe comes from the ocean? Two-thirds of the, all the earth is covered with water. What's under the water? Land. What grows out of the land? Plants. What do those plants, plants breathe out? Oxygen. God is coordinated. And if he can coordinate the earth and the stars and the heavens and the fish and the birds and the air, don't you think he could take care of your little old life? So if God tells you to do something, don't say, well, how is God going to do it? Where am I going to get the money? Where am I going to get this? Where? Oh, please shut up. Just do what God says. He got you. He got you. So here he is. Here's the faith of Cornelius. He says, Cornelius, send men to Joppa. Cornelius says, what if Peter doesn't come? And what are they going to say? You know how they treat us. He says, yes, sir. I got you. Here's Peter over here going, what do you mean by this trance? Knock, knock, knock on the door. Look what it says. Verse, verse 21. Let's, verse 21. It says, Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason you are coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send to you, for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them to his house. The next day he rose and went with them and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. He took some Jews with him. And on the following day, he entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them. Say expecting. expecting. Say expecting. expecting. Say it slow like this. Say eh. Expect. Ing. Uh. <laughs> Cornelius. Verse 24, the following day, Cornelius was expecting them and he had in advance called together relatives and close friends. If you believe God, you only know you believe God by what you do to prove that you think he's going to do what you asked him to do. In other words, if you believe God, prove it by doing something about it. My, my, my wife asked me to paint our house. We, live in the house. we had lived in the house 10 years. Fellas, feel me on this. We lived in the house 10 years. She says, can we paint the walls? I said, the walls are already painted. <laughs> They've been painted ever since we've been here. You didn't notice that? I want to paint them colors. I said, they're painted white. White is a color. <laughs> so because I'm the head of the household, <laughs> but my wife is a neck and she can turn me any way she wants me to go, we painted the house. <laughs> so the painter said, here's your price to paint the house, but I'm also going to give you an additional price to move the furniture. I said, I got kids. We ain't paying you to do that. My kids are going to move the furniture. So <laughs> my son and I are carrying the couch. And in the midst of carrying the couch, my son says this to me. What if they don't come? <laughs> We're carrying the couch for nothing. I said, you're trying to get out some work. Just carry the couch. <laughs> I said, we are carrying the couch out of faith that they are coming tomorrow. If you have asked God to do something and God told you he's going to do it, start acting like he's going to do it. Don't wait for him to do it. That's not faith. Cornelius said, I was expecting you. Here's all my friends and family. I knew you would come. That's a man of God. And he doesn't have Christ yet. Do people who are not Christians act like faith, have faith? Well, yes. Every time you breathe, you, you, you're taking a step of faith. you never seen oxygen. But you go, oh, believe in this something that's going to keep you alive. you never seen gravity, but you ain't jumping off the building. When you love, you take your heart by faith and give it to somebody. Loving is an act of faith. Loving is an act of faith based on a whole lot of feeling and not a lot of information. <laughs> Can I get amen? amen? So yes, people without God, God made us creatures of faith. So when it came time to put faith in him, we would know what it meant. And look what it says. Verse 25, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet in worship. Peter lifted him up and said, stand up, I too am a man. 
Peter said, I'm not any different than you. God showed me. And look what it says in verse 27. As he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered together. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or visit with anybody from another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person unclean. Look at verse 34. Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Say no partiality. Say no partiality. A couple things. The Bible never said to the Jews don't associate with other people. Their tradition inserted that into their religious belief. We have traditions that we insert into our religious belief. God didn't say that. God said, I don't want you eating these foods. God said, I don't want you, I, I don't want you intermarrying and get, getting entangled in their religion. They can hang out with you, but don't get entangled in their religion. Don't be influenced by their religion. The Bible calls Christians to be, not in, to be in the world, which we are physically, but not of the world. In other words, don't be poisoned by the world's belief system. You want to be biblical. And so when the culture is going anti-God, you don't say, well, I want to be relevant, so I'm going to be anti-God. They won't say, might not necessarily say those words all the time, even though they do say those words. You got to say, no, what does the Bible say? So my point is that if you're sitting in IHOP, if you're sitting in In-N-Out or wherever you go to eat, and there's someone sitting next to you and they have nothing in common with you, age, socioeconomic, race, ethnicity, whatever, ever, 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 and you have no association with people like that. And God says, why don't you pray for them? And in your mind, you say, God, you know what? That's not my thing. Those aren't my people. Or whatever ignorant thing, unbiblical thing you just use to justify you not talking to them, be careful. That's what this message is about for all you believers. Open your eyes and your heart to the world. You go to the airport and those people check your bags at the airport. Don't ever think they're below you. I talk to them all the time. I talk to everybody. I talk to them all the time. <laughs> we got guys from our church that are down there, and every time I go, hey, Pastor Bob, like boys. And, and you want to you have a fascinating conversation? Next time you go to the airport or next time you see a foreigner, strike up a conversation with them and ask them how many languages they speak. And whatever number of languages they tell you, and it will be multiple, you just subtract all of them by one, and that's how many more languages you speak. You, they, they speak than you because you only got one. We barely got English right. <laughs> Matter of fact, I know I would fail an English grammar test. And I go, hey, and, and I love talking to people. How many languages do you speak? Oh, I speak uh, five languages, five languages. Now, five languages may sound like bad English, but that brother speaks Swahili, he speaks French, he speaks Spanish, he speaks Italian, he speaks German. They ain't below you. That's your culture. And if, if you would let God open up the world to you, you would have a great time. You might not be as boring as you are. <laughs> Take it for what it's worth. We, we had a fire here in San Diego, the, the first second month we were in this building, 500,000 people were evacuated from their homes in San Diego, October 2007, I believe it was. And we had three, uh, 200, 300 people stay here in this building overnight. It was one of the greatest weeks of this church history. And 121, 122 elderly people from a group home, a, a convalescent home, stayed here. They came here with their oxygen masks. They were like from 70 to 90. And I was so excited because we didn't have that many elderly people in the church ever. I was like, I'm going to meet these people. And, they, and they, were, they were upstairs in the second floor. The World Series was playing. And I was like, I was in it. Now, you have to imagine, these are old people. They're scared. Where are we? What's going to happen to our home? I mean, there's a lot of things you got to think about. They're thinking about. And we said, we're going to make this the best day possible for y'all. What can we do for you? And this one guy said, I want to watch the World Series. So we called Cox Cable and they put Cable in this room and he watched the World Series right there in the seat all by him. I don't know if he was by himself, but there was probably 10 people with him blasting the World Series. <laughs> so I said, you, you guys tell me, what do you guys do at your, your convalescent home? What do you guys do for fun? And they would tell me all this thing. We play shuffleboard. I said, who's the best shuffleboard player in this room? And this 87-year-old lady, oh, yeah. 
<laughs> they all started pointing to it, right? I said, what's your name? And I said, I'm going to come over there and I'm going to I'm gonna play you with shuffleboard. And I'm going to beat you. No, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> I went over to the thing. We had a shuffleboard contest. Two out of three. She won. I don't remember who won the first one, but we split the first two. She had all her homegirls out there cheering for her. <laughs> Ladies in canes, right? get them, get them, Ellie. I don't remember her name. Get them. <laughs> You're not going to win. You're not going to win. <laughs> we were talking trash. We were videotaping it. She was like, I'm so nervous. I'm so. I said, you better not miss because I'm going to get the next one. I'm going to get the next one. I said, You're cheating. That's not right. You can't do that because I don't know shuffleboard rules and they were making the rules up as we were going. I beat her on the last shuffle. <laughs> I ain't that nice. <laughs> What's the point of the story is that there's some people that you think, I don't associate with them. Whether for negative reasons or not, it's just the devil boxed you in. So that means that God can't use you. You're not available. What a waste. And what a lost opportunity for you to meet some fascinating people. Sometimes I talk to people, I go back to the airport, and he's checking my bag. I said, what do you, you know, what do, you do? He says, well, I'm, I'm working here, but I'm going to medical school. Ha! A whole lot of people, you check bags, they would never thought that, brother. And speak seven languages. Went to, grew up in Africa, went to school in London. Fascinating. My point is that God wants to open, get the gospel out to everybody. And if he has you in this little box, he's limited. You're limited in what he can do in your life. And the other message here is that you may feel like God will never accept me. Let's read the verse we just read, verse 34. God, Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. What does that mean? That everyone, everyone say everyone. God welcomes everyone. Here's the catch. When you come to God, you've got to come with no conditions. God, I surrender. Let's, let's keep reading. Look what it says. It says verse 36. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism of John, how God anointed Jesus. Everyone say Jesus. He anointed him of Nazareth, the Holy Spirit, and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all that he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. They, hung, they nailed him to a wood. God raised him on the third day, made him appear, and not, all the, not to all people but to us who have been chosen, as witnesses, we ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Jesus will judge the living and the dead. Out of all the other religious leaders that you have heard about, they are all still in the grave. They're not going to judge anybody. They never claimed to judge anybody. Jesus did. Verse 43, to him all the prophets in the Old Testament bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you will receive forgiveness of your sins in Jesus' name. In other words, when you say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died and rose from the dead for my sin, please forgive me. He will forgive me. And look what it says next. As Peter's talking, words are coming out of his mouth. Look what it says in verse 42. While Peter was saying these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard. And believers from the, among the circumcised, the Jews who had come with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Let me tell you what he's saying here is that the Jews were finally saw it. God shows no favoritism or partiality. Two messages. For all of you who know God, ask God to reveal to you opportunities to talk to people who you might not normally talk to. It doesn't mean you are racist or you are prejudiced or you whatever. You just said, that's not my group. But they are now. As a matter of fact, the brother with the sagging pants, you go talk to a white businessman with a tie, 
he will be shocked that you're talking to him about Jesus out of nowhere. And you know what? He's going to listen to you. And what God does, who? He may blow you off. He may whatever. That's his problem. You do it. And vice versa. You might see someone, oh, I don't want to talk to those gang members. They're not gang members. And if they were, go talk to them anyway. They're people. You don't know what's going to happen. I'd love to take some of y'all to prison. Oh, those inmates. You don't know inmates you've never been. And I promise you ain't going to be what you think. Imagine if, imagine if we had that heart. That there was no limit. It doesn't matter. God, what do you want me to do? Oh, you me some. I, you, I was down at PB running one morning at the beach, and this guy came to me, homeless guy started talking to me. It was his birthday. He started talking to me. He said, my birthday, I haven't seen my kids in 20 years. And, and, and I said, man, that's horrible. And he sang a song. He just started singing. He said, I can sing though. I said, go ahead and sing. And he sang. It's like, so that's number one. Number two, for all y'all in here who you may, you want God and you don't think he accepts you. Oh, he does. Come on. Let's pray. Lord, you love everybody listening so much. And the devil has convinced them that maybe they are too bad or what they've done is too bad. Or they're not accepted because they don't have a lot of money or education or, or they don't have teeth and they're embarrassed or whatever it is. All that means nothing to you. And I pray that we and our love for everybody would represent that unconditional love. If you would like to receive that love of God, today you would like to be forgiven by God. You would like to give your life to God. Pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. But you must pray believing that God really does love you, and he does. And he really wants to bless you. In the privacy of your heart, pray, dear God. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you for being good to me. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, I ask the Holy Spirit to fall on me like they did Cornelius. I surrender my life to you, Jesus. And I know you accept me as I am, but I also know you won't leave me this way. Thank you, God. Eyes closed, heads bowed. If you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you in a minute to stand up. If you are in North County, I'm going to ask you to stand up there as well. Eyes closed, heads bowed. If you prayed that prayer for whatever reason, and you're saying, yes, Lord, receive me today. Just stand to your feet and acknowledge God's forgiveness in your life. God bless you. Stay standing. God bless you. 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 We see you. We see you all over the room. We see you in the balcony. Stay standing. Very good. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Good. 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 Very good. Now in a minute, we're going to ask all y'all who are standing to come down to the altar. If you're in the balcony, all you have to do is turn around and walk up. And the ushers will bring you down. And the rest of us, we're going to worship because it's a good day. And then we'll finish our service after they get down here. So if you're standing up, come down to the altar. Let's give them a hand. They come on down. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You guys can face me. You can face me. Face this way. God bless you. You're welcome. God bless you. God bless you. You can face this way. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I love your hair. I love your hair. God bless you. 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 Amen.
<laughs> God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God has a very well thought out specific plan for your specific life. And he knows everything about your life. Everything. And he knows it better than you know it. He knows what got you into what you're into, what's going to get you out of it, what's going to change. And he knows why he made you. He knows what your gifts are. And none of that you understand as good as he does. And so you have to just trust him that he has it all worked out. And you have to, all you have to do is obey him. Just do what he says. No matter what it feels like. This has nothing to do with feeling. Feelings are real, but they're deceptive. Okay, we get ourselves in trouble because of feelings. <laughs> okay, God, what do you want me to do? Okay, it's a relationship. We want to help you with that relationship. And so we're going to pray for you, and then we're going to walk you into that room. Uh, and I know it's scary, but it's going to be good. I've been, I've been saved for... Th- um, what's this year, carried to three, 29 years. <laughs> and it's still scary. Not all the time, but it's just a walk of faith. It's a walk of faith. But, but God, trust in God works. Uh, two things. We're going to pray for our offering here in a minute. I want you to start praying about who you're going to bring to Easter. And Good Friday, our Good Friday service is going to be in the park at the park, right outside Center Field of Petco Park. I want you to pray about who you're going to bring, bring. Okay? Especially if you work downtown. We want the people to come out of the office and come to the Good Friday service at lunch. It's going to be at lunch, noon. Bring a can of food, give blood, do service, leave. Okay? Be praying about that. Come next week, come early, bring a friend. Let's pray for them and then we'll pray for our offering. Lord, thank you for these people. We pray you bless them. We pray you encourage their faith. And we pray you reveal yourself to them again today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Take a right turn and walk this way. Let's walk this way.